Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you can listen to my podcast, The Long Game, streaming now on Amazon Music. Join us for personal and professional success stories where long-term thinking triumphs, and you can hear about the frameworks, principles, mindsets, and learnings that drive success in business and content marketing. Find and follow us in the Amazon Music app to get every episode. Hey, hey, what's up? This is David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscian Digital, and you're listening to The Long Game. In today's episode, we hear from Andrew Davies. Andrew is the CMO of Paddle, a complete payment infrastructure provider for software companies currently valued at over $1 billion. In this conversation, we talk about his experience going from bootstrapping a company straight out of university, selling it, and then joining as VP of marketing at Optimizely. And now he's a CMO of Paddle. So it's been a very long, arduous journey for him. He shares his biggest learnings from his 13 years as a bootstrapped entrepreneur that he continues to carry into his career today. He also shares contrarian and counterintuitive takes on building a high-performing marketing team. We also get into how Paddle runs a hybrid go-to-market that started as a sales-led program, then layered on more product-led growth motions. Across all of that, he shares how he continues to evolve and grow throughout his career. I learned a ton from Andrew, and I think you will too. Here's my conversation with Andrew Davies. All right, Andrew, it was so great to have you on The Long Game today. Thanks so much for making it time for a conversation. Thanks so much, David. Great to be here. So you're currently sitting with Paddle, and I think the headlines all say a lot about it. You know, 1.4 billion valuation, fast-growing company. And before that, you were previously VP of Corporate Marketing Optimizely, which you joined through selling Idio. Lots of accolades there. Um, walk us through that story uh, just to start and how one thing led to another, because that seems like a fascinating journey. You must have seen a lot. It, uh, it's been a fascinating journey, David. I think... Um... Things often make sense looking in hindsight, um, but looking you know in the moment and looking forward, it was just a case of doing what we could with what was right in front of us and seeing where it ended up. Um, so there's very little strategy or career thought behind that. Um, lots yeah, of chaos, we, <laughs> absolutely lots of chaos. <laughs> um, we had a had a, a business that we we actually founded out of university um, that went through lots of ups and downs. We can go into that if that's interesting. Um, lots of uh, lots of painful parts of that journey, but we eventually exited it in 2019. Um, and yeah, we were the the first of a, a roll up. Um, so first acquisition of a roll up backed by Insight Venture Partners. So we were sell side once and then buy side four or five times as we bought other assets to build this business that's now called Optimizely. Um, and I guess because we were the first acquisition in, myself and my co-founder and some of our senior team got interesting roles, which you know they might have been much more hard to get later on if we were coming in later in that journey. Um, and that was fascinating. You know, I started out my career working at Deloitte Consulting, a very big business um, that was just for a very short time, and then it only worked at startups. And so this was a, a much bigger business that I've been in, been used to. Um, and then yes, joined Paddle as CMO in January, and I'm just really enjoying this slightly earlier stage journey yeah you you mentioned those ups and downs and i saw you're referring to idio i saw you also had through digital before that right so i don't hear you talk much about that what happened to that that effort so at college in the uk you go to college for until you're, until you're 18 and then you go to university um and at college i won a scholarship with deloitte consulting and they were going to fund my university place um, my dad's an accountant, and so pursuing like a, a Deloitte Big Four type role was, you know, perfect. That was all, you know, made lots of sense to him, to me. Um, and I really enjoyed my gap year with them. Where the, I worked for them in their audit team in technology, media, and telecoms. Um, totally outside of my comfort zone. Um, they kind of put you out in the marketplace on a team without much training or qualification. Um, and then I went back there every summer and every winter to work for them. But from that first year, I went to university with one goal, which was to start a business so I could say no to their job offer after I finished university. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, through digital wasn't even the first one. There were more failed ones before that. Okay. Um, my, my first business was in my first year of university was a top-end women's wear fashion label that ended up in court in my second year of university. 
Um, and then there were just, you know, different <laughs> stuff, including through digital. Uh, through digital was was good and it, and it continued to be on uni. Um, but I actually, as we graduated, I, I, I left that to join IDEO with Ed, my co-founder, to fu- found that business because I saw it had much higher growth potential, but still say, stayed friends um, and colleagues, stayed on the board of through digital. And we actually went back and aqua hired the through digital team a couple of years into the IDEO oh. job. I, I don't mean to spend too much time on a past, but you start a women's fashion company, but how did that come about? We had one thesis, which was that we felt um, as two straight 18 year olds with no sense of fashion, that it was the <laughs> most difficult business we could po- possibly set up and the most difficult industry to enter. And therefore, if we tried that first, everything would be easy afterwards. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're doing well. So maybe that was the learning experience you needed. Um, So you mentioned... I I put a lot of... um, I put a lot of credence in people who are willing to have difficult experiences and willing to put themselves out there and learn from that difficult challenge. Um, And I think, you know, having had that experience at Deloitte, where I was thrown into, you know, boardrooms of companies and was expected to know and understand what they were talking with, talking about. Um, I carried that on with, with Eloquio was the name of the, the, the fashion label. Um, and I guess I just, I found that I learned a lot being in those very uncomfortable circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was something I, w- I was used to. Uh, I enjoyed, I felt I learned from. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pull that back in for a question later down the road, but I want to get to Idio. You mentioned lots of ups and downs. I think over 13 years, there's a lot of those you could share, but maybe uh, we can sum it down a little bit. What were the learnings from that experience that you continue to carry out into your career to now? So I think the first one is that Idio was a very impressive solution in search of a problem. So we had some really cool tech, didn't really have a market need. So initially, the engine was powering a personalized music magazine, um, and we scaled that to a few hundred thousand readers. We were making revenue off it, we were bootstrapped. It was completely, you know, we were, we were making profit off it. Um, kind of a flipboard before OAuth for Twitter was a thing, mm-hmm. and before dragging, you know, social data from other places. It was one of the first examples of data portability. We were bringing in data from your different music social networks, Last FM, iMeme, et cetera. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Um, I would have signed up for that if I knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. We had some really, really engaged, really engaged users. Um, and you know, it basically would learn your music tastes and give you music content. And we had about six or seven hundred um, feeds of content, including Rolling Stone and others, Billboard, that we'd licensed to come and power this music magazine. And so it was a digital magazine that kind of appeared on the fly based on your 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 taste um, and based on your reaction to the content. So I guess yeah, one learning is don't build something you know in an abstraction of a market need. Look at the market need first. That's a clear learning that sounds like a truism to everyone listening and to yourself. Um, but clearly, I was dumb enough to to not learn it before we we had to have it by costly experience. Um, so I think that 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 idea of market need and the idea of focusing on market need is really important. And that second piece of focus, you know, on that journey as we found a market need. We still found ourselves selling it into multiple multiple kind of elements of a market need, multiple types of companies, um, trying to deliver multiple kind of definitions of value. And so the focus we went through was on putting our entire business strategy behind a small set of target accounts, a small a small market, um, and experiencing the pain of knowing we couldn't grow to be a massive company in that in that kind of phase, and experiencing the pain of not doing things or getting revenue from people who sat outside of that market, but then the benefit of being able to really serve a market need, really understand the personas, to build a product they really wanted. Um, so that benefit of focus would be would be a second one, and then a third one would just be, you know, deciding who you're going to do life with in terms of the people who you're working with. Mm. Um, you know, as as kind of first time funded entrepreneurs, equity funded entrepreneurs, you know, you suddenly have capital to go and hire people. And we made a bunch of mishires. Um, we had quite a convoluted board at points. Um, and you know, I'm a big believer that the, you know the journey is important as important as the destination, and you've got to make sure you're enjoying the journey as well. Yeah, I love that. Th- things that I, I are very relevant to me me right now. Um, you mentioned. Uh, making a lot of mishires. So let's go to the talking about building teams. So you you got acquired by uh, EpiServer, now known as Optimizely, and the team and business seemed to grow a lot while you were there. So 
What were some of the counterintuitive or contrarian things you learned about building a team? So there's a few things that I think maybe are, are counterintuitive or were certainly to me. Um, certainly there were learnings on that journey. Um, the first one is that, you know, as you scale, there's this awkward sense as a person who loves doing marketing, um, you end up spending more of your time on marketing your marketing rather than the marketing itself. <laughs> Um, and in every function, you know, as a business scales and becomes more complicated, and even within a function as it has more team members, you have to spend more time on the overhead of communication and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so at IDEO, you know, we could have an idea and we could build it and we could go. Um, suddenly in a larger organization, particularly with people I hadn't worked with before and departments I'd never even met, um, the kind of testing and the, the winning of hearts and minds inside the organization around the idea was actually somebody 70% of the job. Finding the idea yeah. and building it were really simple compared to getting it aligned with every other function. Um, so that, I think, is one thing that was a, a big learning for me. I think another one that is in contrary to the, the complexity of scale is that as things scale, things become more complicated and therefore your ideas have to become simpler. And you know, when you start off, you know, often you're trying to, yes, you, you have to be simple because you've got less funding, less time to do things, less team to execute things. Um, but you end up being able to try some quite complicated ideas. Um, and then suddenly when you're at a larger organization, in order for it to align multiple teams, in order for it to kind of manage to um, make sense outside of your little you know, conclave of, of people who've come up with the idea, it's got to be simple. And so you learn the benefit of not trying to swim upstream and trying to keep things super simple. Um, so yeah, though, and then, you know, there's a lot of other lessons that aren't particularly contrary, um, just in terms of, you know, delegation and finding people who can really scale their function and working, you know, trying to work on the business, not in the business and delegating a bunch of responsibility to people who want that as their next career step. And, you know, I've certainly found that sometimes the less I'm involved, often the less I'm involved in kind of what a team's actually doing, the better it will be. And that my job is actually yeah. not to be involved in that kind of brilliant process of creativity or in that you know process of data-driven analysis of what we're going to do next. Um, and it's really about building the team that want to do that and can do that well. Yeah. When, when I've been a part of bigger companies, I was at HubSpot for six years. So I grew up three, 4,000 employees. I was at People AI uh, just recently. And I find that as companies get bigger, it's important to stay simple, but things naturally get more complex or people want to add complexity, make it seem like what they're working on is you know very complex. How do you combat that and move folks more towards simplifying? I'm not sure I've got a, a, an easy answer for that. Um, you know, I think it, it, it is, there's, there's a few things. I, I think firstly, with the function at, at Paddle, so I don't know, marketing here is probably 50 people. Um, so not as scaled as HubSpot, although we'll be chasing you down. Um, and very happy users of HubSpot. Um, but, you know, one of the things is to try and be really clear every quarter um, what the, you know, I, I bake it down to three priorities for the entire team and try and make sure that everybody on that entire team has a way of laddering up their activity, their initiative to that, you know, that, that set of three priorities. Now that might be a subset or might be slightly different to the overall company priorities, but it should be something that everybody's work um, moves towards. And so that's one example of, of trying to make sure that there's a simplicity of understanding of where we're going, even though everyone's mm -hmm. tasks that derive from it are very complicated. Mm, that makes sense. So it's it's just making sure everyone knows what I guess you could call them the rules of the game are. Like here are the priorities, here are the guardrails, whatever. Make, just make your projects uh, ladder up to that, and we're all aligned for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And and, and your phrase there, rules of the game, is something that's you know uh, really meaningful to me. You know, I. I, I've been in a bunch of marketing functions. You know, I've done a bunch of advisory work with lots of other SaaS companies. And you know, one of the things I find is really important in the marketing function is to teach people the rules of the game so they can play it themselves. Um, you know, and in marketing, there's some clear rules around the amount of money we can spend, the customer acquisition cost, um, the type of channels that we can work within, the type of target accounts we've got to go after. And once you set those constraints, then there's the ability to be incredibly creative. And one of the challenges, I think, as you scale a marketing function is that you've got to scale beyond having one or two brilliant people who know all of the rules of the game and can control everything. And you've got to teach everyone the rules of the game so they can play it themselves within the, those guardrails. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of instead of trying to teach people the tactics, 
just tell them the rules and help, help let them figure out the tactics. They might find something better than you can ever think of. Completely, completely. I love that. So how do you, well, I've listened to a couple of your interviews and you talk a lot about building a high performing team culture. What, what does that look like for you and how do you encourage uh, a healthy culture amongst your team? So you might well have, have you know, heard of the author Pat, Patrick Lencioni and his books, you know, Five Dysfunctions of the Team and Death by Meetings. And uh, he's got a whole series of fables that he tells through his books and his, uh, his consulting organization, The Table Group, does some great work with lots of, lots of growth stage companies as well. Um, he talks about how the foundations of any high performance team is trust. Um, and you know, you, you work your way up from trust. Um, and he's got that pyramid that we can we can link off to um from this. Um, but you know, for people to kind of dig into in, in, in more depth. Um, but you know, trust then enables you to have kind of conflict. Um, because when you've got no trust, you can't really have good conflict. Um, and when you've got good trust that then enables you to have good kind of conflict, enables you to come to real commitment, uh, and that enables you to have real accountability, which allows you to have real results. Um, but no trust means you can't really you know have good conflict you can't commit to anything you avoid accountability and then you're inattentive to results and so i think that's a really useful framework um but the bedrock of all of that is trust and it's a question i ask myself regularly you know you, do i trust those around me do they trust me and how can we both mutually build those you know, build that trust um and then the second thing is to layer on top of that is much more kind of a bit more esoteric which is are we genuinely proud of the work we're doing I think being proud of the work you're doing is a leading indicator of you know the results going in the right way. Um, and I think it's important you know to, to to measure the inputs, not just measure the outputs, not just to see did we create enough demand, did we close enough deals, but you know the preceding indicators of that, the leading indicators of that are you know knowing all that we know, are we confident, are we proud in what we're doing? Um, so that's another piece that is you know perhaps not so easily measurable, but something I look for. Yeah, I love that. How do you get a temperature check of that? Is it a, like a monthly survey with employees or how do you stay on top of the sentiment? So I, th- I think the first thing I do is we ask each other it. You know, when someone's Absolutely. producing a new bit of content, a new ebook, a new bit of research, like, are we proud of this? But also, mm-hmm. like, do we need to be proud of this? There's some pieces of what you do that perhaps are more fundamental or infrastructural or, or perhaps they're just, you know, something you've got to do to fill a gap in between two things you're doing um, where maybe, you know, you have to be only five out of 10 proud of it because it's just filling a gap that you know is necessary for somebody. Um, yeah. But then it's making sure that, you know, the things that you really care about that you're asking that question, you know, are we genuinely proud of it? And are, are we going to press publish before we're really proud? Um, and, you know, I think a paddle, you know, my personal challenge here is to do you know, the best the best work of my career here. And it's a challenge I have for my team here that we're going to do the best work of our careers at this business. Um, and part of that is us being genuinely proud about what we're delivering. Mm, I love that. That I'm getting some ideas of how we might start doing that in our business now. Um, so we, we've spoken about the team. Let's talk about the, the leader, the marketing leader. How does this person need to evolve and grow as their team grows. Um, and maybe you can relate that to your personal experience going from your startup to, to a large organization. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked a little bit already about you know the need to you know be involved in alignment and a lot involved in marketing of the marketing. Um, I think that's one thing that's really important, um, and being aware and being open and embracing of the fact that that's actually often where your leverage comes from. If there's if there's a great idea but you've not got that alignment with other teams and there's not the simplicity of its explanation that can carry across other teams, um, then it's just it's not going to get out the door. Mm. Um, and so I think that that's that's one piece of it. You know, we used that phrase to, just just earlier that it's important to work on the business, not in the business. And it's something you know I'm constantly asking myself and trying to up level on. And you know, it was my commitment to to Jimmy, my my boss, the COO, and president of Paddle, and, and Christian, our COO, a CEO and founder, um, as we did my mid mid year review, that I was going to walk out and have my first proper holiday since I joined Paddle. Um, you know, and then come back in <laughs> in the room and clear my diary. And I told my team that as well. There's going to be some one to ones and stuff that I make more more infrequent um, because I need to clear more space in my diary to actually spend some time working on the business and working on the team and on the strategy that will help everybody run faster rather than be working in in the business and i'm 
you know, I love being proximate to my team. I, I'm, I'm very able to cope with many, many meetings a day and go for back to back Zooms all day long. Um, and that can be a real problem. It can be a real crutch that I like being with mm-hmm. people busy. And then I find I'm not getting any of the time I need to go deeper on things. And so protecting that space um, to work on the business is, is a real critical piece of it too. Yeah. Do you have a, a regular cadence where you you audit your calendar and like just keep yourself accountable to to actually doing that? Or is it when, you know, someone tell your your boss tells you, hey, are you working on a business or in a business? So I do think that kind of that informal social accountability really helps. So by telling people that's what I want to do, then I find they check up on me or they say, Andrew, your days look pretty crazy at the moment. Have you, have you, you know, taken a look? Um, you know, it's certainly something I keep a conversation with my wife on, you know, is this, is this you know, giving me enough space for my family? Um, and so, yeah, there is that element of checking it myself. I'm not particularly rigorous about kind of every Friday analyzing my diary and splitting it out. Um, but I find, you know, by, by having it as one of the points of things I want to improve um, and having told multiple other people about it is something that I'm constantly mm. referring back to. It's not something I'm good at. Like I would yeah. you know, spend 10 hours a day different elements of what we're doing and feel completely happy i just know it's something that i've got to get better at for the for the good of the team that that's an amazing tactic just engineering that social pressure upon yourself to to do the things you say you'll do um i love that yeah and i I also you know like a personal productivity hack in the these kind of busy um zoom crazy days is i like to i like to move locations i love i love variety and so i've got my home office but I've also got several places around our house and property that I can work <laughs> from. Um, there's also some cafes nearby. Um, some of those cafes are rubbish to kind of take calls from. And so I know that if I'm there, I can't just jump on a Zoom call. I'll mm. have to be doing something else. Um, there's areas around our house that have got no Wi-Fi. Um, and so, you know, using that as well as a bit of a hack um, that I know that while I'm driving to this cafe and while I'm there, I won't be on Slack, I won't be on Zoom, and I won't be checking stuff. Or I know that if I go to our garden room, I won't be on Wi-Fi. And so those yeah. can be really helpful as well as a physical barrier. Ah, that's great. So you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago that it's as important to look at the inputs um, as you do the outputs on some of the things that you're working on. Just make sure you're proud of what you're putting out there. And I, I heard in one of your interviews that you believe in investing in initiatives that may not have an immediate payoff and pipeline in the next quarter or two, but still very important to the business. What are some examples of those sort of things that that you've worked on that you're proud about that you know you had to get buy-in on that hey it's not going to generate pipeline immediately but it's very important to the business still so in any growth stage startup it fundamentally does come down to revenue right you're trying to grow revenue um, if you're in a for-profit business, that's the fundamental measure that your shareholders are going to be looking at. There's lots of other measures around it, and we want to be good citizens, and we want it to be sustainable, and we want it to be able to continue for multiple years. Um, but the way I think about this is I look at it as, as the two timeframes of marketing. You've got the stuff that you've got to do in order to hit this quarter's demand gen and next quarter's demand gen to make sure your salespeople can grow revenue. And then you've got to do all the things that have very little impact over the course of the next couple of quarters. But if you don't do them, the, the, the pool you are fishing out of in a year or two's time will be too small or will be obsolete. And so then that comes down to what is our company message and story? How are we positioned and how are we trying to work on that positioning? You know, what is our what is our strategy around branding and community building and media and building kind of the the, the pool we want to fish out of? in the future helpful to our target market so that there's some reciprocity and affinity that's being stored up for the future um and so for me you know it's less about trying to have the argument that there's lots of things we need to do and spend money on that are non-revenue related it's really just about time frames and just making sure people know that it's not just about investing in today it's about investing in tomorrow as well yeah it's fascinating to hear that and, and a lot of conversations uh i've had when folks are in a like if it's a VP of demand gen, they're feeling that pressure to to build that pipeline and coverage for the sales team immediately in the next one or two quarters. And it's tough to get out of that that hamster wheel, I suppose. So it seems like a muscle you had to build. How do you typically advise maybe other marketing leaders to to build that muscle and get buy-in on those longer term initiatives when CEO and sales are pounding the table about pipeline? So firstly, I think especially early stage, 
you don't have the you, the right or the luxury of thinking about two or three years out if you're not doing this quarter next quarter um and so i think you know firstly it's probably about doing those shorter term things first to to win the right to think about those longer term things um i do think that it comes from the top if you've got a ceo who just doesn't see that at all um and a head of sales that doesn't see that at all then you're going to really struggle and bringing them on that journey is utterly critical um so if you think about you know analyst relations as an example tactic within marketing every salesperson would love to open up every conversation with the with the prospect knowing about us because we were in the top right of the last gartner quadrant or the last forest away but very few salespeople would like you, sales leaders would like you to take, you know, two days a week for the next six months to build the relationship, spend the money um, and generate um, you know, <laughs> all the work that needs to be done in order for you to get there. And so, you know, part of that is making sure you're delivering what is needed now and then actually not being not being too public or showy or constantly updating everyone about all the things you're doing that are seeding mm. the future. Um, and then that comes down to your sense of trust. We talked about trust earlier in your team. That is about the trust yeah. you have with you, yourself and your head of sales, with yourself and your founder. Um, and, you know, letting them know that this is what you're doing, but it's something that actually they're going to have to trust you on and that you're going to keep them updated on to the point where it's relevant. And I think that's a, that's a really key element of this because some people get very... Um, passionate about talking about the constant updates of what they're doing and the activity yeah. they're doing won't bear fruit. And I think often that's that's going to be a waste of time and erodes trust rather than builds it. Yeah. Oh, that is fascinating. It all comes back down to trust. I I appreciate that. Yeah. And and you know, I was just thinking because you asked the question, you know, what are the ways of actually doing this? What are some examples? And I kind of answered with a a, a, a frame of reference rather than examples. And I don't want to don't want to leave it there because um that, that makes it too easy for me. You know, I, I think <laughs> you know there, there are a few things we've done recently. Paddle, I can talk to you know some examples from, from prior companies too. Um, but you know, let's take the the this we were just chatting before before this this acquisition documentary um, we did. So we did this acquisition of Profitwell, a couple hundred million dollars, big for us, massive kind of transformational moment moment in the uh, in the life of our, of our business. Um, I'm, I'm wearing wearing the shirt right now. You can see you can see the yeah, two logos on the back. Um, and having been through a few acquisitions recently. Um, I asked both founders whether they would be up for us putting cameras into lots of the Zoom rooms and lots of the physical rooms we were having conversations in and recording everything. Now, there were lots of reasons why that was a stupid idea. Um, firstly, you know, are, were we actually going to be able to buy this business? Would having cameras in the room make people act differently? Would us want, Would we want to play up to the camera and try and do things better or differently? Would we be less kind of concerned in the DD if we were concerned about what film we were going to make? There's all those kind of things. And then there's the like the time it takes and the money it takes, the focus it takes. Um, and then there's like, is it is it a good story? You know, are we ever going to do anything with this? There's the risk of it just being left on the cutting room floor. Um, but we did all of that, and I think we produced something really compelling. It's a, a contact of mine, a guy called Pitt Piper, who's an award-winning documentary filmmaker who who um, pulled the storyline together. It's a simple 18-minute documentary called We Sign Tomorrow. You can get it on YouTube and, uh, and on our website. And you know that's an example of something that does nothing for our immediate demand gen. Mm -hmm. But we serve software founders who are trying to scale their business, and many of them will have an aspiration of going through an acquisition or making acquisitions. And there's no content that's really detailed, high dev content no. around the journey and the story and the personal angst and the emotions of what goes on. And so we look to make that. Um, and I, you know, I believe, you know, certainly from people I've spoken to who we, we've showed it to when I've been in the room, there is that sense of, you know, why and how <laughs> have the capacity in the midst of one of the most kind of chaotic times in any company's history to also do this at the same time. Um, and I love that kind of WTF response from the market. And there's a few others of those we've got planned coming up over the next, uh, over the next few months where I think it'll have that same response. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about that WTF response. So it sounds like in this case, the WTF response wasn't just to the documentary itself. It was, how the hell are you making time to do this? <laughs> yeah. How did you make time to do all that? <laughs> Totally. Well, we just just did a, a sponsorship of Sasta, and the team did such a fantastic job. And it was the Profit World team and the Paddle team coming together, um, an event manager from both sides. So field marketing. What was the attended session, wasn't it? Sorry. 
most attend one of the most attended sessions, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I saw that on LinkedIn. One of the most attended sessions. We we you know the team scanned the most leads of anyone in any sponsor at the conference. Now you know those metrics are just a, a nice kind of validations, but we were proud of that. Like I was proud of how the team showed up, um, and you know how the team showed up was a construct of lots of planning, lots of thought, lots of you know, ways of working that Profitwell brought to the table of how they did events prior, uh, massive credits to them and how they built that up. But I believe like, you know, the way we showed up there, again, it's something that we'll be really, really, really proud of and builds for the future and shows us being helpful. You know, we were recording podcasts. Uh, we had an arc, we had a booth that was just about the arcades and people coming and pong rather than getting pitched and we went out and got coffees for lots of the other sponsors and had kind of you know mm. survival kits for the other sponsors for how they could get through the next three days um you know and we had breakfast wow. in the morning you know there was just lots of stuff that was over and above we had we had custom swag every day and if you came the next day wearing yesterday's t-shirt you got that day's new branded t-shirt and every day we had a new style wow. coming out and if you did all of them then you got a hat you know that was the the the, the, the special hat that was the edition that only people who wore the swag each day got and you know and it takes an execution um but it's really just people you know it's the team reaching for something that's going to get a bit of a wow how can they pay so much attention to this type of response um and we want to do that because we care about the market and we want to be the most helpful brand um, but i believe it builds kind of awareness and affinity and reciprocity in in marketing language um and in, in you know in people language i just think it helps us make friends that's amazing. I haven't heard of a sponsor doing that before. And I, I remember I didn't get to make it, make it to Sasser this year, but I remember last year, I believe it was profitable that had the keys, like they're handing out keys to everyone. Like, yeah. Hey, if you want to win a, a, I don't know, a Tesla or whatever it was like, yeah. come try out the key at our booth. And I mean, I got multiple keys because I wanted to win the prize and I kept going back and back and talking to the team. It's it's, that's just one small example of just how creative your team is. So that's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, now our challenge is to find some new things for next year. because there'll be a bunch of people copying that, right? Um, yeah, you're um, going to need to level up the bar there. T- totally. And what, you know, what we were proud of this year won't be good enough next year. We've got to think of something new. And so that's a challenge for the team. But that's also something that people can get excited over and, and people can want to dream into. Um, another great one is, is Ben Hillman, who's on our media team, on our creative team. Um, he's just produced a, a series called Verticals, which is kind of like the SAS Hall of Fame. And so it's him mm. talking to camera with a bunch of animations telling the stories of some SAS triumphs. So I think, you know, his first episode was talking about Zoom versus Skype and how Skype had the lead and Zoom took over. And it's short, you know, 10 minute episodes densely packed with information and insider news about what happened there and graphs about it all gives loads of context to that marketplace and he's got one of these coming out every single week uh, for the next couple of months now again like does it help us sell subscription management tax compliance billing software well no but it hopefully it helps people it entertains them and it builds an audience for us for the future that's fascinating it reminds me of a podcast i used to listen to called business wars if you've heard of it, they do similar case studies where like Pepsi yeah, versus Coca-Cola yeah. and things like that, right? It's not that, but now it's focused on SaaS. It's that's amazing. So yep. uh, let's talk about uh paddles go to market a little bit. Um, because my understanding, and let me know if uh if this is wrong, is Paddle was initially a sales-led company, and then you implemented a product-led growth motion. There's a lot of companies trying to do this and transition. And, you know, there's probably a graveyard of them saying, oh, it doesn't work. Let's stop wasting money on that. But uh, whatever you're allowed to share, I'd love to hear about what that transition or implementation was like. Any learnings you can share for other companies trying to, to make that jump? Yeah. So, you know, multiple years ago, Paddle had did do this before. Um, and then for a few reasons, kind of retracted from it and then uh, went again in, I think it was February or March, we put it live, our self-serve kind of uh, self-serve funnel again. So let's just talk about the principles here. Yes, we are mostly sales-led. Martin, the you know, biggest proportion of our volume comes in via, via a salesperson reaching out or starting a conversation. Um, and our sales, our, our self-service approach was really to try and make a process where someone could come to our site, sign up, go through KYC, KYB, our risk checks, because we've got a whole bunch bunch of fundamental liability we're taking as a a, um, part of that payment stack, um, and get live and start transacting without ever talking to a sales rep. And, you know, 
we've done that. We've seen you know a lot of a lot of volume come through that channel. Even though I think we've you know all of us internally think it's been done really bad and clunk in a very clunky <laughs> way. Um, we 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 make it possible, but it's only just possible. It feels like it feels like we're putting lots of hurdles in the way of the customer to get there. Um, but there's loads of volume coming through it, so we know there's something working there. And now we need to invest and move that. Um, we can talk about a whole bunch of the the kind of the complexity and the challenge that comes with that. But fundamentally, we are in a market where a few things are happening. You know, people are less interested in talking to a sales rep. Um, they want to do much more of the research journey themselves. You know, lots of stats from whether it's CEB or Forrester or other people about how your 80% or 60% or 70% through the buying process um, before you ever want to actually have that conversation. And this goes back to some, you know, some research that Google did, I always refer back to about, I think, 10, 12 years ago, um, called Zero Moment of Truth. And they um, they built out this whole theme of research about the zero moment of truth, where what they were trying to show was that people's, it used to be that people's first moment of truth was kind of that, that moment where they were presented with a proposition. Um, and then the second moment of truth was where they then experienced it after consumption and it either lived up or didn't live up to expectations. And they were saying that there's now this pre-buying research phase. Everybody starts a restaurant search on Google. Every, everybody starts a, a, a car buying search on Google. There's a zero moment of truth. You send that first moment of truth when you're in the car showroom, you're just there to work out whether the brand promise lives up to the research you've seen. You yeah. go into that car showroom more knowledgeable about the car than the poor sales rep who's trying to pitch you <laughs> because you've read every Y car magazine and every review and every rating. So that first bit is that people are choosing, they are empowered um, to do that research themselves. And so I think that's that's one thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is in most elements of software buying and you know infrastructure buying, BP services buying, um, the purchases are increasingly being made by users of those products, not necessarily by buying committees and by senior decision makers. It's not true of everything, but often that adoption cycle starts with people using something, trying something, and then upselling later to a team plan or an enterprise plan. Um, so I think those are two trends that are really important to talk about. And that means that what we're trying to do with self-serve is allow people not to be sold to, is allow people mm-hmm. to try. And it's about serving the buyer. I don't think it's, a, you know, it's, I even think it's sometimes we over-egg it when we talk about a different go-to-market motion. At the end of the day, this is a reverse. This is giving people all of the ability to test and try themselves uh, and explore and, and find templates and build models or whatever your tool does. Um, and, and then work out if it's right for them. So yes, we've 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 enabled that self serve motion. Most of our customers are product led, and so we serve product led mm-hmm. businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got you know three thousand customers live right now who are product led businesses, um, and it's fundamentally around removing obstacles from that pathway. Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned two things I wanted to double down on. One was the friction it takes to get started on your own. Like it's possible, but you got to be willing to put in the work and coming from a, a product management background, I know the phrase is, how do we how do we reduce friction? And one of the things I always push back on is, well, sometimes friction is a good thing. It sees if like how determined and how much they really want to use your product. So they're kind of self-qualifying. Um, and then the, the other thing you mentioned was around just, it's the end user using a product now. And it's it's not a different go-to-market, it's, a, it's supplementary to the go-to-market. It's just another path for them to use the product versus talking to a salesperson. Yeah. And that sense of it being hybrid, um, I think, is the real important message here. You know, product-led does not mean no salespeople. Um, if we look yes. at all the best product-led businesses, they almost all are hiring salespeople as fast or faster than people who are traditionally sales-led. Uh, um, Adam Schoenfeld is a really interesting research. And I can't remember the tipping point, but I think it was, you know, a couple of tens of millions of AI. That if you are product led, by that point, you are hiring salespeople at least as fast as someone who is sales led, if not faster. And so it probably is that in the early days, you pick up an audience and a community that of users and triers. But as you're trying to scale revenue, you know, we know that getting into those bigger accounts and those bigger budgets requires a bigger committee, which then requires a salesperson to juggle that conversation. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important that we we recognize it's not product-led versus sales-led. This is hybrid in almost every circumstance. Yeah. I, I, from my experience, the mistake folks make is 
let's go self-serve. They don't need to talk to the salesperson. We don't need to hire a sales team immediately. And that's that's thinking it's only product and no sales. And now there's this motion of like product-led sales, they're calling it. And yeah. I mean, you look at companies like Slack, and I think in a lot of case studies, they'll say that the mistake Slack made was they didn't hire a sales team soon enough um, to yeah. build out the enterprise motion. So um, that yeah. seems to be ringing true there. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're certainly learning our process of how we reduce friction. And you're right, you know, which type of friction to reduce versus not. You know, for us, it would be awful if we removed the friction of a KYB, KYC check, because we'd have a whole bunch of non-compliant you know, customers we're supporting. And that's a really important part of the process. But we should make that as painless as possible. And we haven't done that yet. Um, we've also got some clients who are doing this journey themselves. So ServiceNow, um, you know, th- their product-led motion is mm-hmm. a paddle cup customer and they are a massive sales assisted business that's now experimenting with a new product led line of business um and it's fascinating to see the challenges they're going through as well you know making sure it's got a new culture and it's shipping product much faster and it's learning and testing and iterating um yeah so it's fascinating seeing it from both sides yeah so uh, i want to kind of zoom out a little bit to something you mentioned before you're you're cmo of a fast growing company worth over a billion dollars taking some of these quite big bets Sounds like a lot of work and pressure. Um, I know you also have a family. So how do you maintain that harmony? Uh, Time building out this thing that I'm sure is taking a lot of time, but also making time for family. So my view of work-life balance is that for me personally, it's not a sense of a pendulum that's balanced in the middle. My sense of work-life balance balance is it kind of flings wildly from one side to the next and passes a point of balance now and again. so, yeah, uh, firstly, it's that, that in my mind, for me, this might not be true of everybody. I love what I do. I get energized by what I do at work. Um, and so I, I see it as one whole rather than two halves that I've got to find a split between. Um, my kids are 10 and 8. They're at the age now where they tell me they don't want me to travel. Um, they want <laughs> me to be there. They get annoyed when I have to go away for work. Um, and so that's a much more vocal kind of partnership than it used to be when they were much younger. <laughs> um, and so with them, it's trying to find a couple of things each that they really come alive doing and putting time into that and making sure it's about quality time, not just about duration of time. Um, and, you know, I know with my daughter, she loves going to a cafe with me and having a reading date and reading together. Mm. And then we get a nice little coffee or hot chocolate together. And she absolutely loves it. Um, or going and knocking a golf ball around a pitch and putt. I know with my boy, it's all about playing football, soccer with him. And if I do that, right. then he's as happy as Larry if I can do that for, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes a day. So I think it's finding those moments of quality time. And it's about recognizing that it's not about splitting time between work and family. It's about making sure that whole works for all of us. Um, and then, you know, I just honestly, I don't feel particularly equipped on this because, you know, I, I don't think I'm very good at it. Like I, I'm mm-hmm. constantly trying to reassess and have that conversation with my wife about is too much being spent um, on Zoom calls for work. But part of that for me is also the benefit of making sure there's variety in my work. I um, uh, Many years ago, six or seven years ago um, with Idio, we went through a, a process of leadership development with, a, with an organizational psychologist. And they spent time with all of us individually. And they spent some time with me. And what came out is they said, Andrew, based on what we've looked at, um, you need to, how do they put it? Um, You're very logical in your decision making. And if you don't get in better contact with your feelings, then that will be a, a limiting factor on you as a leader as you grow, because you also need to use your intuition and your feelings in your decision making. And that's what the best leaders do. So please, can you write a happiness journal for the next 30 days. Now, as a rational, busy founder of a software company, <laughs> that was sounded awful. Uh, but I thought we spent lots of money on these, these guys. So let's do exactly what they told me. And so I wrote a I wrote a journal every day for 30 days on was I happy today? Yes or no, why? And it was really interesting because it gave me pattern recognition. That reflection is really important. Mm. And the pattern recognition it gave me that specifically pertains to this is that I found if I had gone three or four days without speaking to someone outside of my organizational market about something that was different to what I was working on inside the business, might be related, but different to the problems I was facing, that I started to get in a fug and I started to get myopic and I started to get bored. But all I needed was once every three days or so, a coffee, a conversation with someone where I was just helping them with their problem. 
or I was just learning from what they were going through. And it could be the same industry, it could be the same stage, or it could be something totally different. And that gave me the ability to kind of learn from their process and bring back variety into my day. Um, and so for me as well, it's about building variety into what I do as my job, because that gives me energy too. That's amazing. So j- just to summarize that one, by doing that 30-day journaling of your feelings, what made you happy that day or, it, or not happy, you were able to see a pattern that at, for your personality and, and your interests, you felt like to maintain that happiness and not be, become myopic, you need to speak to someone, maybe not new, but learn from someone every couple of days to, to feel like you're, you have something new or some variety going on. Yeah, completely, completely. And now I'm intentional over that. I love that. So yeah. I'll intentionally make space in my diary for those conversations. Um, and, you know, people tell me it's helpful for them, which is lovely, but it's also helpful for me. That's how I learn. That's how I, yeah. I get inspiration. Yeah. So the the last kind of interview question I have here, and we'll go into some closing questions. It it might garner something similar along the, uh, an answer along the similar lines, but I want to see if you have a different response. So I'm just looking at your journey from bootstrapping to selling a business, taking on roles with more responsibility, VP at Optimizely, and then now CMO. I imagine in each different role, you kind of had to become a different version of yourself as those responsibilities expanded and your capacity increased. How did you and how do you continue to evolve and grow? So one of the questions I love to ask in an interview is um, how do you learn? Because I think learning is, is, you know, it's the ultimate meta skill. It's the skill by which you learn other skills. Um, and so one thing is to make sure that I'm always thinking about how I learn. And that can change over seasons of life. It can change in different contexts. Um, and so making sure I'm constantly exposed to other areas of learning is important. Um, I also think that this, this process of growth, often with the people I've spoken to recently and certainly in my own life, this tends to be a process of discovering who is the me that I want to be rather than going out and chasing a new version of myself that I have to recreate or reform or build into. Um, And so often it's chipping away at myself and the things that I don't like or don't want or want to be better at that it is about reinventing myself into some new mold. Um, You know, I, 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 I love what I do. I love my family. I love the companies I work with. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in that situation. There's lots of things about all of those that I want to improve and I'm not satisfied with. Um, but what that leads me to is wanting to be, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatist who's constantly biased to action, but wanting to build more time into my day to reflect on, you know, mm. How can I how can I be better in that moment, or how can I do that better, or what would be my reaction to that rather than the reaction that I feel is socially conditioned or is based on fear or is based on some other emotion that is not going to be beneficial in the circumstance? I love that. It, it sounds like there's a good amount of introspection there, um, and it seems like you make time for for that as well. Yeah, I, 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 again, I don't think it's something I'm good at, but it's something I benefit from, and therefore try and be better at. Um, you know, one of the one of the you know, I invest in a few seed stage businesses, and one of them that I'm really really excited by at the moment is a yeah. is a is an automated coaching app, um, and it's an app oh. where you just you, you talk to it and ask reflective quest. It asks you reflective questions and helps you build those soft skills by putting those reflective questions into your day. Um, so yeah, it's something I'm passionate about, and and certainly I'm I, I am trying to be better at. What what is that app called? It's called Coach App. Oh, very straightforward. That's a great domain they got there. <laughs> yeah, it um, is. It is, and, and it's pretty. It's kind of. I'm not sure you can even download it yet. It's kind of stealth and before before okay. being live. But I, I, I'm on the the trial version, and it's great. Okay. Yeah. Well. Well. I'll take a look at that. Um, so we'll wrap up here with a couple closing questions. Um, mm-hmm. What's one opinion about business that you think people would disagree with? Oh, goodness me. So for me, business is an engine for learning. 
Mm-hmm. That's kind of the be all and end all for me. When I stop learning, I'll probably be stop it, stop being interested in business. Uh, and that won't be because I've stopped learning because there's nothing else to learn. It'll be because <laughs> you know, I'm tired of it or you know whatever it might be. So yeah, for the me, as long as I'm learning, then business is exciting. Um, the vehicle of business that I'm working in now and have been working in prior opens up a new market, a new value chain, new terminology, new people. Um, and uh, I find that really interesting. Mm. What's one impactful piece of advice you've been given? What's one impactful piece of advice I've been given? So this is slightly controversial. Um a peer mentor, a fantastic uh, CMO in London called Nicola, um, who I've got lots of respect for, um, challenged me based on this this top point of variety we've just discussed. Um, she challenged me to go to my board and ask for a four day week so that I could spend a day a week consulting other businesses as part of helping with that variety um, and learning uh-huh. from other contexts. Um, and I did. And in terms of impactful advice. Um, that really set up a whole bunch of, bunch of growth for me personally. It helped me learn from a whole bunch of very interesting people. Relationships have got to this day. Um, yeah, and that, w- that was really meaningful. Wow. Was that a difficult ask for them to accept? So it could have been, um, but I made a case that you know the, the the company I'd been in there at that point probably for eight years or something working every day to make sure that asset was built um and we didn't have any learning and development we didn't have any, t- any time for money for that um and so I said look you know if let me take this day a week if it ever gets in the way of my work day and gets in the way of my productivity and what you think I need to deliver then we'll have the conversation I'll wind it down um but mm. let me try this for six months and see what happens and we did and then we carried on Wow. I love that. Uh, It seems like more people in leadership in general should be taking that day. Yeah. Um, yeah. If that's how you're wired, some people can't, don't don't like and don't want a lack of focus. But for me, it really helped. Yeah. What's one book you'd recommend to more people read? Goodness, I'm a reader and um, this list could be extremely long. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Give me one second for. I one I read. I'm sure you'll cut this so it sounds a bit better. Um, one I read recently that kind of comes back to this idea that we talked about a couple of times um, around judging the inputs, not just the outputs, is the score takes care of itself, um, which is mm. by Bill Walsh. Um, so yeah, I know nothing about American football uh, and the NFL, um, but you know apparently he's a big he's a big cheese in that world. Um, but yeah, that that whole concept of making sure that it's not just about measuring the output and the scorecard of everything you're doing, um, but it's about what goes into it. I think I think is really really impactful. Yeah. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? You know, I'm just in between two books. I just put down um, the. I might go to my rucksack. I might even be in here. <laughs> I can wave it in front of you if it is. No, it's not, uh, unfortunately. Um, I have just finished um, Bad Blood, which is about Theranos and the scandal. Um, yeah. I was probably a bit late to read that, um, but I found it utterly fascinating and gripping and terrifying at the same time. I have it on my shelf and I still haven't gotten to it. Um, oh, re- do you recommend it? <laughs> make sure you've got like two days spare so that when you pick it up, okay. you don't put it down. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I, I used to have a read. My bookshelf used to have a reading ratio of maybe 80% read. And over time, I've just, I've just continued buying books. And I'd say I'm at 60% now. I, I, I feel like I got to slow down my book buying and catch oh. up a little bit. David, so for me... The measure in my life of whether I can buy books faster than I can read them is like a key metric of whether I'm happy. (laughs) I I genuinely get a bit depressed if I realize I I can buy books faster than I've got the time to read them. And I kind of have to put a moratorium on it and stop doing it. Um, I love it when I get to the end of the bookshelf because it it means I've finally caught up. Um, so yeah, and, and let me let me throw one in there that's probably a bit yeah. less well known. Although um, I find it, you know, when I read it, probably five six years ago, um, it I really found it super interesting. It's a, it's a book by um, by Peter Diamandis, 
um, who runs the X Prize Foundation um, and and Kotler. It's called Abundance, um, and it's a it's a kind of a techno optimist book, um, all about kind of the future of technology and the evidence for abundance. Uh, I think the subtitle is "The Future is Brighter Than You Think" or "The Future is Better Than You Think." Um, but yeah, super interesting for those in technology to think about some of those exponential technologies that are causing things to potentially be positive in a world where there's lots of bad news around us. Well, Andrew, you just gave me two books. I'm going to go buy immediately. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, all right. So last question here is where can people find you on the internet? I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Feel free to grab me there. Andrew Davies, um, a paddle. You'll find me on LinkedIn there and Jay Davies um, on Twitter. Um, I'm at various SaaS conferences around the place um, and Paddle has got offices in London, New York, Boston, Salt Lake City. And so often in one of those as well, uh, but super happy for a reach out on LinkedIn. I love connecting with people. Amazing. Andrew, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for the time. Total pleasure. Thanks so much for the questions. This is really interesting, David. Thank you. Thank you.